Friends, I always enjoy coming here, and I'm always uh, motivated by Heinz because he's so energetic and he works so hard. I get to see a little bit behind the scenes as to what he does. It takes an awful lot of work and an awful lot of enthusiasm to be able to put together an organization like this, and you're benefiting from that. It's really a joy to see. ICR and Answers in Genesis and CMI and various other national and international organizations uh, sometimes are more splashy, but it's really the local organizations that are involved in creationism that really are more effective in the sense of uh, touching so many people. Uh, these larger organizations couldn't do what they do without local organizations like yours. So I just want to express appreciation to Heinz and to your organization as well. I did spend a long time with ICR. I wish I could still be there. My health didn't uh, hold up too well, so today uh, I'm kind of retired, sort of against my will. Uh, but even in retirement, I still continue to get requests and I try to, to provide uh, some ministry. My wife and I just recently moved from Camano Island up to Rockland, uh, Rockport, and we found a small church in Darrington. There's only about uh, 30, 40 people in that church, but I've already been asked to teach a, a Sunday school lesson on Genesis in January. So uh, I keep busy no matter where I'm at, it seems. Tonight I want to speak to you uh, on the topic of, um, let's see what we got here, let me make sure we're, uh, we're at the back end here, can I take it up to the front? Up at the top somehow, there we go. I want to speak to you tonight on the topic, the floods came up and the rains came down. Now this is to some degree outside my field of expertise. Uh, my training is in atmospheric science, but I was part of a group of scientists who were involved in asking this question or dealing with this topic. Uh, the scientists involved were Steve Austin, John Baumgartner, Russ Humphreys, Andrew Snelling, Kurt Wise, and myself. And this was a number of years ago, and we dealt with the issue of what are some of the basic physical processes that can explain what caused the Genesis flood and what were the impacts. They had to be really dramatic. Um, now, I, I need to kind of qualify some of my comments here to start with by saying that there's all kinds of theories and ideas of the Genesis flood. There's probably uh, half a dozen, at least, major theories of the Genesis flood. The one I'm going to be talking about is the theory called catastrophic plate tectonics. And it is controversial. It's been around now for a number of years. We presented this for the first time as a group. In fact, we were known as the gang of six <laughs> that put this idea together. We presented it at the International Conference on Creationism in Pittsburgh a number of years ago. Since that time, uh, we've continued to build on the idea but uh, there's others who've come up and criticized it and still sus don't uh, like some of the ideas in it. One of the ideas that people don't like is that there is a conventional view called plate tectonics, which uh, takes millions of years to occur. It's the movement of plates on the surface of the Earth very, very slowly. You've probably heard the discussion of the separation of the North and South American continents from Asia and Africa, or from Europe and Africa, moving apart at the rate of about a centimeter per year, or about the rate that your fingernail grows. Well, that would take millions of years for the Atlantic Ocean to open up. So some people, uh, some creationists are concerned that we've become uh, compromised by adopting that theory. Well, we have not adopted that theory. And to explain that clearly, we use the term catastrophic plate tectonics, which means that we believe that that whole process occurred basically in one year. In other words, the movement of the continents around on the surface of the Earth and the spreading that you see between North and South America and Europe and Africa, we think happened in about a year's time. Now that, to the conventional scientific community, is heresy. They think we're nuts but then they think creationists are nuts to start with. 
But we as scientists who have earned degrees, earned PhDs, every one of these gentlemen on this uh, board here have a PhD in their specialty, um, we have used and applied the knowledge that we were given in our training in order to be able to apply it to the events that are described in Scripture and to try to validate or confirm that from the evidence that we find on the crust of the earth. Now, this has been discussed from time to time in various meetings. This presentation tonight is a general uh, presentation. Uh, it's, it's an attempt to be able to explain it in a little more complete form so that you can understand why we think the flood occurred only a few thousand years ago, and it was truly catastrophic. Every time I go back and look at the events of the flood, I'm amazed. It appears to be more catastrophic than I've considered before. Volcanoes went off. Earthquakes occurred. The ocean covered the continents. All the forests were destroyed. There was sediment laid down over a mile thick on average over the surface of the earth. Much of the sediments ended up on the bottom of the ocean today where there's all kinds of sediments on the bottom of the ocean. There's volcanoes that erupted on the bottom of the ocean. Did you know that there are something like 10,000 volcanoes under the ocean that we don't even know are there? We're just familiar with this chain that runs up and down from uh, Canada down to California here on the west coast, but they're all over the earth, but there's many, many more under the ocean. So how did all that get there? And that's what we're trying to explain. Now, my particular involvement was as an atmospheric scientist because it turns out that I, one of my specialties that I dealt with was the Ice Age. How did that happen? Well, it turns out that the catastrophic plate tectonic model explains how the Ice Age occurred. Now, that sounds a little strange, but we will get through that and include that. That's that was my contribution to this, quote, gang of six. Okay, well, first let's start off and say, how did the ocean basins and the continents form? We believe that before the Genesis flood, the Earth was relatively smooth. There was one continent and one large ocean. After the flood, we've got mountains. We've got separate continents. We've got a number of oceans. There's been a big change, but how did these ocean basins and continents form? Now, in Genesis 1-9, we find this statement, and God said, let the waters below the heavens be gathered into one place and let the dry land appear, and it was so. Now, this is on the third day of creation. The first day of creation was where God uh, revealed that he created all things, mass, space, time, energy, on the second day of creation, which is one of my favorites, that's when the atmosphere was formed. The waters were separated from above the firmament from the waters which were below the firmament. On the third day, God continued to separate things. He, he created and he made things. In this case, he was separating the water from the continent. So there was one continent formed and oceans and an ocean formed. But that's not the way it is today. There's been a change. And we uh, begin to look at some of the evidence that we find around the globe, and we ask another question. Is it possible, and this is part of the theory of catastrophic plate tectonics, did a seafloor upheaval cause the Noah's flood? Some people think of Noah's flood as simply, well, it started raining. And a lot of rain fell down, and it rose up and covered all the continents, and then somehow the water went back down again. Well, it appears that there was much more going on than just simply rain. In fact, the way in which the order of it, it says in Genesis 7, 11 through 19, which is the description of the flood, the beginning and the process and the ending of the flood, all the fountains of the great deep were broken up and all the high hills under the whole heaven were covered. And then, uh, well, let's see, let me go on to another. Well, okay, I'll come back to another statement here to complete that thought. Let me give you a little description here of what the earth itself looks like. Now this may take you back to high school where you had a, a course uh, uh, and they talked about what the inside or the interior of the earth looked like. Um, we'll review that a little bit here. This is the earth's internal structure and it's made up of various concentric spheres with the inner part being the inner core made of iron, 
typically is thought to be very hot but solid, an outer core that's very hot and iron, but it's more molten, surrounded by a mantle material, and the mantle is kind of a plastic. It's not as hot as the center of the earth, but it's still very hot and more of a plastic-like material, and then a crust surrounding that. Now, the approximate size of this is the radius from the middle of the Earth out to the end above the crust is about 4,000 miles. The mantle is about half of that, so it's about 2,000 miles from the, crust, or the top of the crust down to the, top, to the bottom of the mantle. And the crust itself it varies between about 30 and 50 miles in thickness. It turns out that it's thinner over the, uh, underneath the ocean than it is under the continents. And we'll see a diagram here that helps explain that in a moment. But we get some information from out in the Pacific Ocean that's quite fascinating. Here is a diagram or a picture or a model of the Earth. And you can see Australia down here in the lower left. So this is the Pacific Ocean. Here's uh, Alaska and the coast of North America, and over here is Asia. But you got this gigantic amount of water out here. It turns out that for the last 50 years, we've had ocean drilling projects that have gone out, and they're a typical ship with a, like, a, what looks like an oil derrick mounted on the deck, and they drill down. They actually, it's a oil, like a derrick that drills holes, like if you're going after oil on the continent, but in the ocean, it sits on a ship, and they lower this drilling rig all the way down through the ocean to the ocean floor, and they drill out cores on the bottom of the ocean. They've done that, and they store these cores. Uh, one of the laboratories where they store all these cores is in San Diego, and another one is in New York. And these cores have shown that the surface, or the, the bottom of the ocean out in the Pacific is relatively young. Now, we don't believe, at least as young Earth creationists, we are very skeptical of the ages that are given for these cores, but the relative ages are probably okay. If, when we get done with the ice, radioisotope project uh, that we've been working on for a number of years, we may be able to adjust those ages and still use that data to get a real age, and it's gonna be a lot younger than the conventional age is. But for the interim, we just use it in a relative sense, and we find that the ocean floor out in the middle of the Pacific Ocean, rather than being on the order of four and a half billion years old, which is the conventional age for, given for the Earth, it turns out that many of those cores are on the order of a half a billion years in conventional time. But there are places kind of edges around there near the continents and in a few seamounts on the floor where there are a few pieces of, sea cru or of, of crust of the earth that are on the order of a few billion years old. It appears that the ocean floor has disappeared somehow. So this group, the catastrophic plate tectonics model, has suggested that the ocean floor in the Pacific Ocean and various other places sank down into the mantle of the Earth. Now that sounds like a really peculiar idea, but when we go and look at some of the seismic data for inside the crust of the Earth, back on the, let me go back here if I can, back here where the, inner, inner, uh, the outer core is, if you look down in here with the seismic data, we find big chunks of rock resting on the top of this outer core, as if the bottom of the ocean, which is missing, has fallen down through the mantle and is now resting on the outer core down in the earth. Now that sounds really peculiar. In fact, it's one of the biggest problems most people have. How do you get this rock from the crust floating, sinking down through the mantle, which is thought to be plastic or maybe even hard rock, and how does it get down through that? Well, that's one of the things we're gonna talk about here. Uh, before I go to a, a little bit of a physical description of that, we find some evidence not only in the ocean, but on the continents where there has been a lot of geological work. 
One of the places that the scientists from ICR and Answers in Genesis and various other groups have gone to look at what it's like down in the crust is the Grand Canyon. And I've been in the Grand Canyon over a dozen times myself, leading backpacking groups and studying the rocks in the canyon. And it's quite fascinating. This particular picture is down in the inner gorge. This is the Colorado River about a mile below the south rim at Grand Canyon. And the lower part of that, about 1,500 feet or so, 1,200 feet, is basaltic, uh, is material that has been reworked. It, it has been heated and cracked, and uh, magma has gone in, the cracks in between, resting on top of that, from there all the way to the rim, which is about 4,000 feet up, is sedimentary rock. This is rock we believe that was produced during the flood. It, this whole lower rock was ripped off by the movement of the waters in the flood, and the sediments were then laid on top of that and then turned into rock. That's why you find it horizontally layered. There's all kinds of different types of rock as we go up. Now, a lot of the lectures that I've given, and Dr. Austin in particular, and Dr. Snelling, we talk about all those various layers I'm not going to talk about those tonight. I'm going to talk more about what's down in here. This next diagram shows an interesting feature. This is Dr. Austin standing down in the bottom of the canyon on top of a layer of Vishnu uh, sorry, Zoroaster granite and Vishnu schist. These are very dense type rocks that obviously at one time in the past had been melted, kind of like toothpaste, and because of the movement around, they produced all kinds of little lines, wavy lines and so on in the rock. This shows that because of processes down in the crust, there was a lot of heating and movement of that plastic rock, which then re-solidified and is now exposed at the bottom of the Grand Canyon. Basically, the Grand Canyon is the most incredible place on the Earth where there's, there's this big gash down through the crust and you can walk down and look like what it, see what it looks like under the ground in the rocks in Grand Canyon. So to a geologist, it's a, it's a wonderland. Uh, they go down there and study this all the time. All the geologists all over the world go to Grand Canyon to see what the middle of the crust looks like. Now this is a mile down into the crust. Remember, the crust is basically about 30 to 50 miles thick. So one mile down into the crust is still the upper part of the crust. Okay, now here's the, what we believe the initiation of the flood was like, and this is the description from Genesis chapter 7, where it says, the same day, this is when the, uh, Noah entered the ark, the same day were all the, uh, the fountains of the great deep broken up, and the windows of heaven were open. Now, the sequence there is important. Um, typically, when uh, a and a, 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 an event occurs and it's described first, it's the more important event. So in this case, they found the, the, the fountains of the great deep were broken up, and then the windows of heaven were opened. And the fountains of the great deep is saying that there was a lot of water coming up from the crust of the earth, possibly even from the mantle down below, coming up to the surface of the earth and contributing to the flood. And the fountains of heaven... I'm sorry, the windows of heaven opened up and there was like the sluice gates were open and water came in and contributed to the flood. Well, it's probable that, and you should probably consider it this way, that the majority of the water that came to the flood came from below. It didn't come from the rains of heaven. That contributed to it, and it was a lot of rain, but it was not enough to cover all the mountains on the surface of the earth. Most of that water came from the fountains of the deep. Now the question is, what are the fountains of the deep? It's likely that much of this came from uh, sources of water in the ocean and was uh, cast up out of the ocean, possibly from the mantle or the crust, and brought to the surface, which then covered the continents. The windows of heaven, we believe, is water either coming from, <coughs> coming from the uh, atmosphere or above the atmosphere, are coming in from space into the earth. Now I have to stop and say briefly here that I've been an advocate all my life of, um, excuse me, let me get a drink here. I've been an advocate of all my career in creation 
as a, a, uh, of the, of the um, canopy theory, and I still believe that there was a canopy before the, before the flood, and it contributed to the flood, but it did not contribute a significant amount of water to the flood. Because if it did, then the canopy would have had so much water in it, it would have produced an incredible greenhouse effect, which you know all about from the global warming problems we, that people talk about today. But it would have caused temperatures to be as hot as they are on Venus, which would have cooked Noah and his family completely. It would have parboiled them. So I have to uh, kind of dial back uh, the estimates of how much water came from the, uh, from the rains during the flood. Now, it's possible that much of the rain in the flood came from water being shot, shot up from the fountains of the deep into the atmosphere and above and then falling back through the atmosphere. Excuse me there, I get kind of dried out as I get excited when I talk. <laughs> well, at any rate, I, I want to talk a little bit about that sequence because the fountains of the deep happened first, then the windows of heaven occurred. Okay. Here's kind of a key, and the next couple slides are kind of the key issues in understanding catastrophic plate tectonics. The origin of the flood waters uh, probably can be explained this way. This is the situation we think, and this is a theory. It hasn't been proven, but it's our understanding, which is the basis for our catastrophic plate tectonics model, that before the flood, you had basically th um, uh, three layers here. You had the general crust, uh, with water on top of it was the ocean. You know, the crust is much deeper than the ocean. Now, the ocean in places can be as deep as seven miles, but that's still shallow compared to the depth of the crust, which is as much as 35 miles. And then below that is the mantle. The ocean was relatively uh, light, the crust was more dense, and the mantle even more dense than that. But here, there is some differences between the continental crust and the oceanic crust. The, continental, the uh, continents are basically sitting on top of the mantle, and the mantle is very dense. The crust, the uh, continental uh, 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 continents are less dense, so they're like uh, wood floating on water. It'd be like having a tub of water and you put some tubifores in there. That's kind of like what the, uh, um, the continents are. They're, they're big chunks of rock, but they're less dense than the mantle, and therefore they float and can possibly move around. The oceans in also have underneath them a relatively thin crust. As we say, it's missing, it's gone somewhere. But before the flood, it was probably r very dense, more dense than the crust of the continent and of the mantle. So down here, those of you that got some mathematical background, this means that the density of the continents, the density of the mantle, were all less than the density of the oceans. Now, what that means is, uh, the, the ocean crust, that means that you've got a situation where you've got a more dense layer sitting on top of a less dense layer why would it stay there? It would be, and the best way I can explain this, it'd be like if you took, if you've seen the experiment, maybe you've done it yourself, you take a metal razor blade and you set it on water. And because of the surface density of water, that metal, uh, the razor blade made out of steel, which is more dense than water, maybe sometimes three, four times more dense than water, will sit there because of the surface tension. And then if some disruption comes along, it will sink down into the water. We think that may have been what it was like before the Genesis flood. So in a sense, the situation was set up so that this process could start. OK, now, some event occurred. And jokingly, our group talked about this at great length. What could have started this process where you have an unstable equilibrium with a dense crust under the ocean sitting on top of a less dense mantle? Some people have suggested, and I tend to like this idea, that possibly at the time God brought judgment upon the mankind on the earth, he sent asteroids and meteorites and all kinds of things to intersect the earth which could have upset the crust, uh, banging into it and breaking things loose. But 
Scripture doesn't tell us that. That's all hypothetical. Uh, kind of a humorous event might, uh, has been suggested that when God shut Noah and his family in the ark and slammed the door, the vibration from the door slamming set off this unstable equilibrium. Yeah, I don't think that's happened. But obviously God was in control to start this process, and how he did it, we don't know. Oh, I'm sorry, I didn't describe that. At any rate, somehow near the uh, edges of this unstable uh, oceanic crust, it started diving down through the mantle. And here we got a diagram showing it started to go down there. Because the crust went down, some of the mantle material had to resurface and it came back up. And then there was a circulation set up in the, the uh, uh, mantle of the earth. And if you show another diagram, this would be what, sort of what it would look like as in the outer part of this, as the uh, crust went down in various places, it brought the mantle up, which was hot, and it went up through the ocean, and you had hot material directly in contact with ocean water and even up to the surface. This was modeled by Dr. John Baumgartner, and I need to give you a kind of a little interesting testimony of Doc, Dr. Baumgartner. When he, when he first started his ministry, he started working with Campus Crusade. And he worked with them a number of years and talked about uh, young earth creationism. Um, although Campus Crusade is a very accepting of many ideas along this line, they didn't want one of their uh, staff people making that one of their main part of their ministry. So John felt the need to become more knowledgeable. He was already had a bachelor's degree in electrical engineering was involved in Christian ministry, but he felt the Lord calling him to go back to graduate school and get a degree in geoscience or geophysics. He went to the UCLA, the University of California, Los Angeles, and he worked there and he got a master's and a PhD in geophysics at that laboratory, at, the, at, the, at school. His dissertation was to develop a large type computer model that was unique in that it, it had a mesh, all these grid points in it, that did not have any location at the North Pole or the South Pole that could cause disruption. He used a pentagonal pattern, which you can see little pentagons here, in a three-dimensional grid, and he was able to do modeling of the Earth's mantle on the UCLA computers with millions of grid points. It was unique, it had never been done before. He was awarded a PhD with distinction and because of the uh, honor that he received and the knowledge that people recognized in what he had done, he was hired by the Los, Am Los Alamos National Laboratories up in the mountains of uh, New Mexico. Not only was he hired to work in, on their computers and continue the development of the research in his dissertation, he was given 50% of his time to work on anything he wanted and use the computer resources and he chose to, to use the same model he was developing for Los Alamos on his creation model. And so that was the basis of his doing his research that led to the simulation of the processes in the mantle that led to this catastrophic plate tectonics model. Well, I gotta move a little faster here. One of the things he built into his model was to start his model with a single continent and a single ocean like we believe that the Bible suggests, and it was, it's called Pangaea. And so all the, continents were all, uh, all the continents were together in one, and by then initiating a process where you had parts of the crust diving into the mantle, it began pulling the continents apart on the Earth's surface. I don't have time to get into the detail here, and it's more complex than I can even understand, so i just give you an idea. Here's an, a place along the coast of South and North America where he started the model with a sinking of the crust down into the mantle. There's sinking over here. Wherever it's blue, you see it sinking. And in between, it started rising back up, and it began to split the continent apart. And you can see where the continents that we know today were originally started, and they began to be pulled apart, and ocean formed in between. Here's a view from the South Pole, this is Antarctica, and you can see these arrows here, how the motions were moving and pulling the continents apart. Here, 
you can actually see on this model of the Earth where some of the magma came up between the North and South America and Europe and Africa, and you can begin to see something called what we call today mid-ocean ridges, where this hot magma from the mantle came up through the crust and was solidified into a mountain range between there, and it goes all around the globe. Here is a Mercator projection of what we now observe. Now, this is actual data. This is not model. His model, when he did that, began to simulate what we find today in the actual data. This was discovered in the 60s by ships outfitted with Doppler radars looking down to see what the depth of the ocean was over the surface of the, of the oceans. And what you find is where you see these light blue lines out in the ocean, this is deep water where it's dark blue. This is shallow water all along this line here. And what that is is what's a, it's called a mid-ocean ridge. It's where the magma came up and solidified and formed a mountain. There is a 40,000 mile long mountain under the oceans of the world that extends like a baseball seam around the Earth, down through the North and South Atlantic, around the tip of Africa, up into the Arabian Sea, actually up into the, up the Red Sea, and part of the Persian Gulf. Also, there's a split here where it goes down this way, south of Australia, out into the Pacific Ocean, and back up this way. That's 40,000 miles long. That mountain is 6,000 feet high in places, hundreds of miles wide, and at one time it was, it was molten. So you can imagine what it did to the ocean. It heated the ocean, and we find today, I'll show you another diagram in a moment, where the temperatures of the ocean were raised up to as high as 120 degrees Fahrenheit. Today, they're about 40 degrees Fahrenheit. So the oceans were much hotter in the past than they are today. Okay, uh, in addition to that, on the continents, much of this magma was forced up in underneath the continents and filled in cracks in the crust of the earth much of it where the sediments from the flood occurred and was squeezed out like toothpaste in places horizontally called sills and in vertical locations called dikes and in volcanic regions where the magma still is active today, even coming out of the volcanoes up and down the west coast and around the world. Here's an example of action in the past where the the crust of the earth was actually plastic, and by movement, tectonic movements, the rock was actually molded, again, like toothpaste, and then solidified. This is at Grand Canyon again, to the north of the Colorado River on a side canyon. Uh, if you go to the south rim of the Grand Canyon and you look eastward, and you drive about 30 miles east, you'll actually drive downhill into the desert. And the reason for that is, the land near the south rim of Grand Canyon was raised up, and the land in the desert was not. This is the border between those two. The desert is out to the left. The, the uh, region near the south rim of Grand Canyon was lifted up, and you can see how sharp it was at this point, and then it was hardened. So that would have cracked if it was solid rock when it was lifted, but it was plastic, hot and plastic at some time in the past. Okay, now there's other things that occurred. and. Uh, Near the boundary between the continents and the ocean floor, there are conveyor belts bringing the sediments on the bottom of the ocean floor to the continents and continuing to follow down where those layers dove down into the mantle, scraping off many of the sediments. And when this whole area here was hot and lifted up during the time of the flood, it caused the continents to go down because of motion moving them down the friction between this conveyor belt actually moved the continents downward and lifted the water upward, which then went onto the land, moving sediments onto the land, and then later, as the continents then rose back up again after the flood, much of that water came off the land, bringing the sediments back in and dumping it back in the ocean. That's why at one time, the Bible says, all the, all the mountains were covered, all the high hills were covered with water and the sediments were brought over the land. That's why you find seashells on the top of the highest mountains on the earth. Okay, the waters retreated from the earth, going and retreating, and the waters were going and falling until the 10th month. 
This is toward the end of the flood as the waters were coming back off the continents back into the ocean. Here is what you find in many places around the earth, particularly in Utah. You'll go and you find sandstone. This is sediments that were in the ocean that were brought onto the continents and deposited, and it was moving sand under several thousand feet of water as the water moved onto the continents. And then on the way back, well, th there was a lot of activity here, which I don't have a lot of time to go into now, but if you go down in Grand Canyon, you find something called the Great Unconformity. We saw it in an earlier diagram where you saw the horizontal layers and the crystalline material down below. Here is the boundary between that. Down below here is that crystalline rock. Up in here is the sedimentary rock, and embedded in the lowest layers of that, called the tapeat sandstone, are these gigantic boulders made out of the material from this crystalline rock below. So when the flood occurred, it seemed to have come across ripping up the underlying hard rock, breaking it into a lot of boulders and rolling along, and then when the waters began to slow down, the sediments froze it in place up above that conform in great unconformity. That's one of the arguments, or one of the observations that I've seen personally down in the Grand Canyon that convinced me that the Genesis flood was a real event. Some of these layers of sandstone that we said were brought onto the continent spread out all the way across many states. Uh, for example, all of, in, from California into Nevada and Utah, up into Wyoming, all the way up into Canada. Some of the tapete sandstone covers large areas of many states out in the east. It's the same kind of rock that has been distributed by the movement of water onto the continent. Some of this actually is worldwide. There's one layer of material that you can trace from uh, Arizona and New Mexico to Kansas all the way over to England. The cliffs of Dover, the white cliffs of Dover are of the same material you find in New Mexico. So we're talking about layers that were laid down by gigantic events, regional if not global in size. Okay, and coal is the same thing. Coal is nothing more than solidified organic material and it was buried by rock. We dig it out today, but it is also a type of rock. And dinosaur fossils, a dinosaur national monument, they were, dinosaurs were killed during the flood, millions of them. Clams, here's a stratified layer of clams. They're t they tend to be closed, which indicates that it was a catastrophic event of some type. Now, here's, here's something fascinating. This is again at Grand Canyon, and this is at uh, Marble Canyon, and there's two types of erosion evident here. When the waters came back off the continents and moved back into the oceans, it carried sediments with it and eroded the top surface in a wide area of, of erosion called um, a planar erosion. There are many regions around here, just generally flat. There's a few places left over with little uh, uh, buttes of stratified material, but it's generally very flat, indicating the water coming off the continent eroded it in sheets. And then as the water kind of receded, and there became less intense flow, it tended to cut down into the lower part of these, forming the inner canyon. So this is called downcutting as the water uh, cut in a different way than this planar erosion. Here is, again, uh, side canyon erosion, which has been later, but it's all in Marble Canyon. We've taken raft trips down through here and shown people all kinds of evidence down in Grand Canyon. Answers in Genesis still does that today. If you want to have a raft trip, you can still sign up with that with Answers in Genesis. Okay, now, we're getting close to the end of here, and I want to give you a, a sense of the events that occurred during the flood were catastrophic, high-energy, incredible uh, destruction. But with time, since the flood, this is, would be at the end of the flood right here, and time moving this way up to present, Many of these events were extremely catastrophic and energetic during the flood. For example, the amount of rain that fell, the, um, the number of, and intensity of the volcanoes, the temperature was high, uh, 
All of these were extreme at and right near the flood, even up to maybe a thousand years after the flood, but with time it declined exponentially so that it approached the rates of, of, of geological processes and atmospheric processes that we have today. In the process of going from here to there, something else that I was interested occurred called the Ice Age. And it was because the oceans were left warm by all these geologic events. As I said, from the seafloor sediment measurements that were made, we were able to estimate what the temperature of the ocean was in the past. Now, the conventional estimate of these temperatures was millions of years ago. But if it was not millions of years ago, which we don't think it was, if you compress that time scale down, this is the kind of diagram you get. These are in temperatures in degrees centigrade, and it actually was hotter than that. But you'll notice this characteristic exponential decline. The temperature declined, and according to a biblical time scale, it looks like this. This is what the type, and this is the temperature of the oceans. It's very similar if you took a cup of hot coffee and you put it out on the table, and it's initially boiling. Because of the greater temperature between the co hot coffee and the cold room, it cools faster initially, and as it gets cooler, the difference in temperature between the coffee and the room decreases, and the rate of cooling declines. So it cools off exponentially, okay? And that's the way these processes occur, and the same thing with the ocean. Before it cooled off, back here when it was still warm, the oceans caused a gigantic El Nino effect. In other words, there was a lot of evaporation from the oceans over the continents. The continents were cold because of a lot of cloud cover from the eruptions of the volcanoes and all the particulates in the atmosphere. And the oceans were, uh, the, uh, the continents were cold. This warm moisture coming from the ocean was wafted over the continents and it fell as snow in particularly in the polar regions and on the mountaintops. Did you know that Mount Rainier, during the Ice Age, the ice and snow up there was 3,000 feet lower than it is today? You, you, you can take one of the roads that goes up to uh, Paradise from the southeast corner of, of uh, Mount Rainier National Park. You'll come to a place called Box Canyon. And there's all kinds of evidence that the glacier was down at that place and lower because you find all kinds of carving by the ice of the glacier. And that's a good two to 3,000 feet lower than where the ice is today. OK, same thing in Yosemite National Park. I've modeled this, computer modeling, of all kinds of, of, of events. And I've been able to show that the rate at which snow and ice accumulated uh, right after the ice age, uh, right after the flood, during the ice age, could have accumulated up to one or two miles of ice and snow in the polar regions and on mountaintops in less than 500 years. And that's using the conventional computer models that we use for much of the modeling for forecast today, the only difference being the ocean temperature was much hotter. That's my contribution to this project. This is uh, Yosemite National Park, where the Yosemite Valley, you know where the Half Dome is? That whole area was covered with ice. Half Dome was almost covered to within about 200 feet of the top with ice. The whole valley was covered with ice. The overlook at the glacier overlook was covered with ice. There was ice on top of that. And it covered this whole area of the Sierra Nevada uh, with glaciers at that time. But we believe it was due to the temperature of the ocean. Yosemite Valley itself, there you can see a half dome up in the distance there. So the ice was actually, the ice sheets and glaciers were filling this valley all the way up to there. When it melted back, it left the hanging waterfalls because the ice moving down the valley ground away the lower parts of the rock, leaving vertical walls and a U-shaped valley. OK, so here's the equilibrium we have today. After all of this high energy catastrophic process has occurred, today we have very small continental movements. We have only a few large earthquakes compared to the way it used to be. We have a few large volcanic eruptions. We have stable ocean levels and temperatures, relatively stable. They go up and down a little. We have minimum ice sheet coverage. The only place we really have permanent ice sheets today is in Greenland and Antarctica. And the reason those are still there is because of the really unique situation at those locations. And we have relatively minor climate fluctuations. 
I'm not an advocate of global warming to any great degree. I believe global warming is occurring. I don't think it was produced by man. I think it's a solar effect, and there's all kinds of oscillations, but they're not anything like what happened following the Genesis flood. Okay, real quick, here's some resources. You're familiar with the Genesis flood by Dr. Henry Morris. That's a great one. And the Genesis record, this is my favorite book by Dr. Morris, a commentary on the whole book of Genesis. Dr. John Morris is uh, the young earth. There's a later edition. Uh, but this talks about the age of the earth. And it gets into a lot of detail on that. St Andrew Snelling's book, The Earth's Catastrophic Past. Here's something you may not know. This book, a two-volume book, was commissioned by Dr. Morris as an update to his book, The Genesis Flood. Did you know that? I don't think that's generally known, but that's why that book was written. This is a, a video in a book, Thousands Not Billions. Some of these are still hard to find now. Uh, only Thousands Not Billions book is really readily available, but you can find some of these as used books on Amazon.com. That one you can probably find on Christian books. This is volume two, which is the final result of the rate project, which is almost impossible to find now. If you do, it's used, and it could be as much as 100 bucks for it now. This is John, uh, Steve Austin's book on Grand Canyon, Monument to Catastrophe. This is one of mine, uh, Climates Before and After the Genesis Flood. These are hard to find, but you can still find a few of them here and there. So that's the catastrophic plate tectonics model. Thank you. Thank you, Larry. And we're going to take some time for Q&A. Uh, so think of a question you might want to ask. And uh, it doesn't have to be limited to the topic that Larry discussed here. He's obviously with 30 years with ICR. He's got a lot of knowledge. And uh, so feel free to ask him any kind of question related to uh, creation. And uh, while you're thinking of that, uh, we're going to uh, do a free will offering, like I, I said. If you uh, want to support the, this ministry, you'd like to see you know, these speakers coming in, feel free to uh, uh, contribute either here or uh, in the back. Uh, and also, the, some of the books that Larry mentioned, I should say, uh, we do have a lending library. Uh, come on forward. Uh, we do have a lending library, and that book, Thousands Not Billions, and also the DVD on that topic is also available if you want to just uh, borrow that for a period of time. So, um, questions that you might have. Yeah. I'd like to know uh, a little bit about uh, Dr. Vardaman's um, involvement with the rate project. Uh, I think that's radioisotopes or, uh, in the age of the Earth. I'd like to know a little bit about that. Okay. In, in fact, he spoke on that very topic this morning for the students at Grace Academy. Well, my involvement was kind of as the project administrator. I had the uh, unique experience of being a project director for a major cloud seeding research project in Central California called the Skippy Project for the U.S. Bureau of Reclamation. And I learned how to uh, uh, spend a lot of money, <laughs> get contractors, and coordinate uh, research for that kind of a program. That was a multi-million dollar project as well. And in that experience, I uh, was able to coordinate uh, government employees, academic people, private companies, uh, and which is a, an interesting challenge because you have different kinds of perspectives on things. But because of that experience, the Lord prepared me, I believe, to be able to begin or to initiate the uh, rate project. Uh, the rate project was originally thought by the board members at ICR, uh, particularly one, a, uh, one of the members of the board, because he felt, and a number of people felt, that this was just the key issue that really bothered so many people. Uh, if you can't, can, can't understand or explain at least somewhat the disagreement between billions of years and thousands of years, I mean, we got a factor of over a million there, we ought to be able to understand that somehow. So 
nobody had really ever, well, in, some individual young earth creationists had uh, chosen to do that, but they'd never been able to solve it by themselves. And in some of them, they had actually shipwrecked their faith because they couldn't come up with a solution. So one of the things that we decided we needed to do was to put together a team to encourage one another and to uh, sharpen our, each other. And uh, when we went out to uh, describe this uh, to people, we got all kinds of good response. And we ended up raising over $2 million from the general scientific, uh, general Christian community to fund this project. Contr ICR contributed about a half a million dollars. But what, what was wonderful to see was the money came in as we needed, as, as, it, as we needed it as it went along. And uh, he also provided the insights and the concepts and the ideas and provided the laboratories to do the work in. And the results were just fascinating. I mean, basically we found three major issues. One, we were able to show that coal had to be young, which is generally thought to be 100 million years old. We found that um, um, the uh, zircons that are embedded in granite, in the biotite in granite, which is typically dated at a million and a half or two million years old because of the uranium converting to lead at a very slow rate, when it also produces helium in that process, the helium was still there. And it, at the rate at which it diffuses out of the zircons in the rock, it shouldn't be there if the rock is that old. And we were able to actually get numbers for that to show that those zircons were 6,000 plus or minus 2,000 years old based on the helium. And then there was radio halos, which I don't want to get into. That's a bit complicated. But that also agreed that the, the rocks were young. So that project uh, was extremely exciting. It was the first time a project of that scale was ever done. It's kind of the standard now, and there's other projects, particularly in genetics, where teams have been put together in young earth creationist circles to do kind of research of that order. I might just say, uh, as a final statement here, we've restarted that project because one of the deficiencies of the rate project was that the information generally got out to the Christian community, but it didn't get adequately published in the conventional scientific community. Only in one circumstance did we report it at the American Geophysical Union meeting in San Francisco, and we got an incredible response there, but nobody believed it because they couldn't accept the idea. But they couldn't criticize our procedure. So we've decided that we're going to reinitiate this project, and we're going to get additional core samples. We're going to analyze it and attempt to report it in the conventional literature. Now, whether we'll be able to get that done is questionable, but we're going to take a shot at it. So we're in the process of raising funds for that now. Yeah. If the ocean temperatures went up to 120 degrees, what happened to the fish? What happened to the fish? I always get that question. <laughs> Very good. Okay. Well, first of all, let me get a drink here real quick. First of all, uh, marine organisms, particularly clams and bottom dwellers, uh, and fish were the largest numbers of fossils you find anywhere on Earth. So there was tremendous numbers of them that were killed, probably cooked and then buried. But obviously many of them survived. They didn't go on the ark. They didn't have to. They could still live on the, on the, on the, on, in the ocean. But there's two things that challenged them. One is... Um, depending on whether the ocean was salty initially or not, could they handle the change in salinity? If it was no, not much salt in the ocean, that was mostly contributed by the flood, how were they able to chan, cha, handle the increase in salinity? Or if the ocean was salty and, uh, uh, or hot, how could they handle the heat? Well, there was all kinds of complexity during a catastrophic process. First of all, you had fresh rain falling like crazy, Water, fresh water, is lighter than salt water, so it tends to want to float on top of the salt water. So you probably had a layer of fresh water, relative cool water, laying on top of the oceans of the world. When the continents began to come back up, you had all this rain and snow on the continents falling and melting and running down the rivers into the oceans, forming lenses of fresh water over the ocean, and that water would have been cool coming off the continents in particular. So there were places that the fish could go 
at, at, which had different degrees of temperature and salinity where they could survive. So that's basically my explanation for that. And we have, by the way, we have very good evidence for these layers or these lenses of fresh water floating on the salt water. That happens anytime you have major floods going down the Mississippi. Though that water comes down and floats into the Gulf of Mexico and up the east coast in the Gulf Stream. It's a layer of fresh water that tends to do that. And for example, even the Columbia River out here, when the water comes out the Columbia River, it goes out into the ocean for miles. Los Angeles has threatened to come up here with their tanker ships and take the water. They can't get it out of the river because it's all controlled. But out in the ocean, it's anybody's game out beyond 12 miles. They can get all the water they want and tank it to California. Do we have other questions out there that uh, take advantage of Larry being here to answer them? Yeah, my question was um, the theory of the catastrophic plate tectonics. What was the ma major criticisms by the conventional science, and and what were your how did you refute those or answer those? You mean our our comments at the, the American Geophysical right, Union meeting? Right, right. Yeah, what were their major criticisms or... Yeah. Um, well, the comments, first of all, were they couldn't believe that young Earth creationists could do that kind of science. <laughs> I mean, they were surprised. And they couldn't help but congratulate us on it and say, you need to do more of this work. Uh, another comment from a fellow by the name of um, Dalrymple, who was the author of the book... Um, the Age of the Earth, which is kind of a classic in the field from uh, uh, radioactive dating techniques, uh, took it upon himself to keep track of what young Earth creationists were doing in this area and report back to the American Association for the Advancement of Science at their annual meeting each year. And one year after we were beginning to report our results, he reported to them, he says, he said to them, um, these guys, if they're right, these guys deserve the Nobel Prize. But they can't possibly be right. They're young Earth creationists. So that tells you something about the attitude. At the uh, meeting where we presented the results, uh, basically the comments were of extreme skepticism. This can't be right. It can't be true because it, it violates all the knowledge that we know. But some of them said, we'll go back and we'll test some of these in our own labs. We have at least one report back from one of those labs where they did that result, they did those tests, and they confirmed what we had found. Now, most of them didn't report back, and from the attitude that you have, you can understand why they probably didn't do that. But we, in the um, online literature, for about five years or more, we got a constant dialogue going between old Earth creationists and uh, conventional scientists about this project in which they criticized the techniques that we used. And Dr. Russ Humphrey spent probably a good two years of his life rebutting those questions and was able to com completely refute every, every criticism that came along. So we feel very good about uh, the whole result of that project. It just didn't get out to be a um, major piece of information to the scientific community, let alone the general world. Yes, sir. Uh, Larry, um, for dummies like me, can you give just an uh, elementary definition or description of, you mentioned that the core is solid, and then there's the molten, and yeah. then there's the crust. Well, there's a mantle in between there, too. And, and it's kind of a hot plastic-like material. Okay, so what, I guess, the understanding that heat rises, why is the core solid? And then the mantle and the crust, what's causing it to cool? Is, is that it? And then what, what how does that work with like K Kilauea? And then just as a quick secondary question, about two months ago, I read an article where we are due, we're like 50, 100 years past due for a major tectonic shift that's supposed to cause a tsunami that'll take everything out from I-5 West. Okay. Do, you, do you know anything about yeah, that? Yes, I do. Uh, well, the, the thing that complicates this whole thing is that as you go down through the Earth's crust and mantle, you find different types of minerals, and they are solid, they are in solid form or liquid form, depending upon pressure and temperature. 
and that complicates this whole thing dramatically. So, for example, one of the things, there's a good likelihood that much of the water that came from the fountains of the deep was actually by the shifting of the mantle and the lower crust. Many of these minerals changed form and they had connected with them uh, water molecules so that water molecules was released. One of the theories of the flood is that there, there were at one time in the past big lakes of water in the crust down deep in liquid form. But it is not necessarily needed because much of that water could be tied up in the rocks themselves and as it changes form, it releases the liquid water in the form of steam which comes up and shoots and jets up into the atmosphere and so on. So to go beyond that, uh, it's outside of my expertise, but it's a very complex situation down at those temperatures and pressures. In terms of the situation uh, here west of I-5, there is the San Andreas Fault that runs up through California, off the coast of, uh, the, of California there, just north of San Francisco at the Rays National Park. It's out under the ocean floor and the further north you go up to this area here, it's about 75 miles off the coast out here, off the coastline, off the beach. And about 300 years ago, or a little more now, there was a major shift along that fault, just a standard earthquake, and it shifted, causing the one side of it to rise up and the other side to drop down, in addition to horizontal motions. And when that happens, it produces a tsunami. And the size of that tsunami was such that it wiped out almost all the Indian tribes all along the west coast about 300 and some years ago. That it apparently is overdue to happen again soon. Basically, when that happens, you hear that pop or you hear the rumble, you've got 15 minutes to get to high ground because it takes that long to get from 75 miles off the coast to the beach. And it's going to be big enough, possibly big enough, to go all the way to I-5 in places. Does that help? That doesn't help, does it? <laughs> so get, get That's prepared. why I live in Rockport. <laughs> <laughs> Other questions people may have on the, you know, the right, this topic or any other creation topic? Okay, if not, I want to, again, uh, Larry, thank you for your time here and for answering the questions. And you'll be available at the back after we break here, and people will uh, okay. yeah, want to ask you some more questions. Well, again, thank you for your interest in uh, what we do here at the forum. Um, we have a lot of interesting speakers planned coming. You know, Larry, of course, handled the geology, meteorology, and the atmosphere. Next month, we have the Dr. John Bile coming, and he's going to answer the question, is distant starlight a problem? And that's a question that many people have. You know, what about the starlight, the thousands of years of the age of the universe, and the star, yet light takes billions of years to get from some of those distant galaxies, supposedly, to get here. So John Bile is going to answer some of those questions for you. Um, and he is an astronomer. He's retired now. He uh, used to teach at the, the University of uh, uh, Trinity um, Western there up in Canada, up in BC. And so he's retired from there now, but he's still very active in speaking and uh, researching on this topic. And then the next month we have somebody speaking on Lucy. Is Lucy real? Yeah, why is he still, why is she still in our textbooks? because she's been disproven as a transitional fossil. Well, what else are they looking for? And he's, uh, J.D. Mitchell is gonna answer those questions. And then coming next year, we have some other interesting speakers that we're talking to, to answer some of these hard questions that you or your children at school may have asked. So keep that in mind as we go forward. Um, in the back, again, we have you know, books and DVDs we have many new pamphlets there on the table there, uh, which we make available, which answer some of these specific questions in each of those pamphlets. We buy them in bulk, and so we can offer them at uh, you know two and three bucks a, a pamphlet, and uh, they're very worthwhile, very interesting uh, coverage. Uh, the other thing I should mention for those of you that signed up for the mailing list, 
We're now using a, a program called MailChimp, uh, which is used to distribute the notices of these meetings. And uh, you'll notice there's a very different kind of appearance than we used to send it out when I crafted them myself and sent them out. Uh, it has the same information, but it's presented in a very nice graphic format. And so it's much easier to maintain the, the, uh, uh, those notices. Um, you can, you know, you're on that list because you had signed that piece of paper at some point in time, say you want to be on the list. However, if you, f if you don't want to subscribe anymore, it's very simple to do an unsubscribe. And uh, to, when I put that up, uh, we have over 500 people on the list already, and uh, one person asked to unsubscribe. Not very many, so it's very encouraging. And uh, again, so thank you for your interest in the topics that we bring up here, I'm trying to answer some of your hard questions. If you feel that you want to have a speaker on a specific topic, and uh, it, it just let me know here at the meeting or just send me an email, let me know, hey, I'd like to get this speaker come in, or I'd like to see this topic covered, let me know, and we'll see if we can find a speaker for that. So again, there are refreshments in the back, tables, resource tables back there, take advantage of those, and uh, Larry will be available to answer other questions that you may have. And uh, again, thank you for your interest and for your support. Let me just close up in a word of prayer and then you'll be dismissed. Father, we come to you to thank you for this time we've had, uh, for the knowledge that uh, Larry has gathered over all these years, studying your word, studying nature, and uh, seeing that there are explanation for some of those hard questions. And we thank you for his uh, diligence in doing that. And uh, we just pray that you would use this meeting 